All right, in the Southern Hemisphere in the 1840s, a star uh, brightened, and 140 years later, we see a structure like this, which is the homunculus, and it's about 20 arc seconds across in the uh, sky, but at a distance of 7,500 light years, this is a half light year across. This actually represents molecular hydrogen emission that uh, uh, came out in the 1840s event. It represents something between 10 to 40 times the mass of our sun that was thrown out by this star. And actually, Eta Carina is not a star, it's a binary system. And it has a five and a half year period and it goes through a high state for about five years in which we see broad emission lines and a low state which is due to when the two stars come very close together and uh, th uh, the winds of the primary star capture the radiation. This shows some of the wind-wind interaction structure uh, between Eta Carina. Um, really what it is is two stars interacting with each other one star is at least 90 times the mass of our sun, the other is 30 times the mass of our sun. And this is showing that the star, when they come close together, well, close is rather a relative term. Perhaps you can see the two little pins down there. That's a distance of one and a half of, of the distance between sun to, the, to Mars. And obviously you can tell that this is a very, very large scales. In fact, the scale that you're looking at here is probably about 100 times the distance from the sun to Earth. So rather large scale. But it shows you the magnitude of the winds that interact with each other uh, in Eta Carina. And these are continuously flowing. To give you an idea, the primary wind is moving at about 400 kilometers, per, 450 kilometers per second. And every thousand years, it throws out a mass equivalent to our sun. Or let's throw it another way. Uh, every year, it throws out a mass equivalent of Jupiter or a thousand Earths, which is rather quite an amazing amount of time. But what we see is the interaction between the stars together here. And this shows some of the interacting structures that uh, we've been able to pull out from our 3D models. And this is the first time we have done a print of a theoretical model system here. And we knew about structures that are in the plane of the orbit, but when we did the printout, we found a lot of little finger-like structures that we had no idea existed until we did the print. <laughs> Literally, when you take a slice in X, Y, and Z, you're, not, you're gonna miss a lot of things, and obviously, you miss them. And we're learning a lot about this on it. What has a significance to me is I have been over the last uh, five and a half years using the Hubble Space Telescope to observe Eta Carina and look at the wind structures, not at this scale. No, we need a telescope that would be 10 times the diameter of Hubble to do that, but as structures that are 10 times larger than this. This is the wind, wind interaction that is going on right now, but actually the winds expand out continuously and at uh, five and a half and 11 years later, I'm able to see the fossil winds expanding across the sky. And uh, well, across the sky is a relative term. By then, they're all within about one to two arc seconds, which at the distance of um, Eta Carina is like 9,000 Earth-Sun distances. <clears throat> but they're rather large structures that we can detect spectroscopically with the Hubble and the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph in which I helped build Really, uh, I guess it shows my gray hairs, but we initially started building the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph in 1984. We finally put it into Hubble in 1997, used it until around 2004 when it failed. The astronauts went up to the servicing mission four and repaired it. And the first thing we did was an observation of Eta Carina, which was to show that it was back in operation. And indeed, it is in operation. For the past five and a half years, I've been following it with, uh, with the Hubble.